آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ So one contribution philosophy can make is to encourage people to think about really basic questions like why do we care about free speech in the first place what's the point of free speech because often people don't stop to think about it often people just use free speech as a mantra philosophy can help in understanding how certain kinds of silence can occur which might otherwise go unnoticed where the silence isn't just a matter of having the state breathe down your neck with its threats and penalties but something much more subtle it can help us understand the point of free speech it can help us understand certain sorts of silence and it can also help us understand what speech is i mean what is speech is it a matter of just saying meaningful words Would Robinson Crusoe, alone on his island, have speech? Would he have free speech if he couldn't talk to anyone? Yeah. I think that these are philosophical questions. I don't know if I can promise that they are questions that philosophy uniquely can contribute to. That was your question. I'm sure many other disciplines can contribute to answers to these questions. But for me, those have been some important issues. So it's a familiar thought that the speech of some people can silence the speech of others and in a way that's exactly what's happening when governments for instance are uh, silence or censor certain speech speakers because they do it through government or legal speech another sort of more familiar example where the speech of some can silence the speech of others would be if you were in a room and someone was heckling uh someone uh was yelling and drowning out the speaker there you would have a silencing occur occur that was uh drowning out a speaker through speech itself what i have in mind by silence is something a bit different but it's got something in common with that in order to understand it you need to step back and think well what is speech anyway because it's against that backdrop that you can understand what silence might be if you think that speech is a matter of making meaningful noises then anyone who is stopped from making meaningful noises is silenced but if you think of speech as a power to perform certain speech acts it's a it's an ability to do things with words then silence is a matter of being unable to do things with words the kind of silencing i was concerned about when women are silenced is a very particular sort of silencing of a speech power that is exceptionally important what i have in mind is the power to perform the speech act of sexual consent and sexual refusal i am of the view which many people share and certainly many feminists are concerned about that sexual violence is a very serious problem and it's serious in part because it is so underreported and so we have here a situation where a harm is being done to women of a systematic nature that is not being addressed and i would say it's not only a harm it's an aspect of injustice now there are many many explanations for this but one thing that a philosopher can point out is that if in certain situations a woman is saying no and that is not being recognized as a refusal that is silence that is a kind of silencing it's the silencing of a speech act that is so important that either making it or not making it is the difference between something wonderful consensual sex and something terrible namely rape so it's a really important speech power how could it be silenced it could be silenced if women don't have the authority another possibility is that um the hearers are in the grip of rape myths women who say no don't mean no so when a woman says no she doesn't mean it it's just part of a game it's insincere 
Besides, just like that, she was asking for it. So what's coming out of her mouth? No, we've got to weigh up against what's coming uh, through her clothes. She's dressed like that, so she's asking for it. So this um, issue about speech acts being silenced in sexual contexts is of massive importance. And, of course, philosophers don't normally look at this sort of phenomenon, but anyone who is... Um, concerned about equality for women should care about speech and speech acts that matter in this way and how they can be silenced in ways that become visible when we see the point of speech which is to perform certain speech acts and especially in this context uh, important speech acts like consent and refusal. I talked about how one explanation for women's silence might be the prevalence of certain rape myths or the perception that women don't have the authority uh, to be in charge of what happens to their own bodies. Now, you are asking about the role of pornography in that, and I have argued that it is an empirical question whether pornography may contribute to uh, the prevalence of certain rape myths. In the definition that was put forward by Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon, Pornography is the graphic, sexually explicit subordination of women in pictures or words that also includes women dehumanised as sexual objects, things or commodities, enjoying pain or humiliation or rape. And then there are many other conditions. But this gives you a sense that it's a particular sort of pornography, as we normally think of it, that's at issue here. There might be a huge amount of pornography that doesn't subordinate women. I'm only concerned with the sort that does. There is data, I understand, that people's normative views do change in response to pornography consumption. It's well enough established empirically that liberal political philosophers like Ronald Dworkin concede that there is evidence that pornography, as he puts it, weakens attitudes towards sexual violence. So it's not simply a story about pornography as a as causing certain harms. It's a story about pornography as a piece of authoritative speech. If it did not contribute to the prevalence of rape myths or the undermining of women's authority over their, over their own bodies, um, then the argument that I was giving about uh, pornography would, um, would, wouldn't be the same. People tend to focus on censorship and I myself have said that, it, that for certain material, censorship would be justified, but that's not the only possible strategy. You could have something that was equivalent to zoning. You could have, um, you could have a system that was more careful about um, making sure that you only got to see pornography if you really wanted it. So that's an opt-in system rather than an opt-out system. It's very curious because liberals talking about pornography a couple of de decades ago took for granted that zoning was, was a shared premise. Of course we should have zoning. Uh, of course we should make sure that pornography isn't there for people who don't want to see it. In practice now, partly as a result of the work of those liberal political philosophers, Pornography has become ubiquitous and zoning has gone completely out of the window, partly as a result of their work, partly, of course, as a result of technology changes and the internet. I think it would be wonderful if bad speech could always be fought with good speech. You would need something closer to a perfect world for that to happen. In practice, bad speech can't always be fought with good speech precisely because of the issue about silencing that I already mentioned. So if a speaker is silenced by the bad speech, then it's harder for them to answer back. Obviously, when the bad speech is undermining credibility in such a way that it is silencing the speech of 
certain groups so that when they say their words it doesn't count as what they're meaning them to be that's that makes it impossible for them to fight bad words with good there are actually much more mundane reasons so th that's a re that reason i find philosophically interesting and i find it genuinely important but in but of course I mustn't get so obsessed with philosophy that I don't notice the much more straightforward reasons why it's hard to fight bad speech with good. The very straightforward reasons are the targets of the hate speech, when it's propaganda, are very often not part of the conversation. Maybe they don't speak the same language. Maybe they um, are not, maybe they're not reading the same newspapers or on the same blogs. It would be very unlikely if they were. So in the present situation, um, it's not, they're silenced through the structural isolation of our speech situation, where people are, you know, speaking in little echo chambers to each other without letting others in. So um, I think that, that those kinds of walls, I mean, we talk about free speech, but in fact, there are walls everywhere because people will only, through their own choices, speak to their own little tribal members. And that really exacerbates the uh, the tendency for bad speech to have its bad effects and in fact to be welcomed for its bad effects because it then builds those walls and those feelings of belonging and the tribalism even more and to me that that um, tr sort of tribal feature of our speech situation is one that I myself have completely neglected in my own philosophical work but I think in practice it's at least as important. One thing that interests me about free speech debates is the way in which um, particular horrific events get stamped as the free speech issue in ways that then make invisible much broader patterns of silencing. These sorts of silencings that are going on in the background are so ubiquitous that they don't attract attention. But in my view, they are at least as serious because they enact the ongoing subordination of different social groups. One other area that I think is of tremendous interest is in a context of controversies about speech, whether pornography or hate speech, and in a context where there are challenges to addressing those through legal means, although by the way, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the uh, UK is signed up to the UN Convention Against Hate Speech, so we do have anti-hate speech legislation, but in a context where it's not obvious how to address them, I'm interested in the possibility of people taking more responsibility for our speech. This means both as individuals and as institutions. So philosophers sometimes say that, you know, there's a knowledge norm for assertion. That is to say, you shouldn't say something unless you know it. In fact, on the internet, that's out the window. People say stuff without owning it. They say it anonymously. They say stuff when they're in a bad mood, and it's out there forever. People and media, institutions and individuals, we need to take responsibility for what we say with our backdoor speech acts as well as our explicit ones. And I think that even there's, there's even scope for the state as a speaker um, to speak not just through enactment of law, but in a more educational role. Here's one area. When it comes to women's um, civil standing and women's vulnerability to sexual violence, it turns out there's a huge mismatch between what people believe is an okay thing to do and what the law requires. And I think this is because um, sexual uh, ethics is being outsourced to pornography. It shouldn't be outsourced. And if it is going to be outsourced, we need to have more speech 
about that and more speech from speakers, perhaps in schools. And this would be the, the state as a speaker, not as a legislator, but as a contributor to information and making sure that people know what justice requires for them. Because it's not enough having rights, you need to know what your rights are, and young women uh, don't. So let's all, let's all, both as individuals and as institutions, take responsibility for our speech, even while we recognize that we are free to speak and that that's a really vital uh, power that we have. Thanks. Free speech.